Hello and welcome to Fourth Valley and West Lothian Regional Improvement Collaborative Supported Study Resource for Higher Business Management and this is the second session. Care learning intentions for this session is to consolidate and support study skills for higher business management and also become more familiar with the course study guide. So our success criteria for this session is that I can apply the correct command words for the business management exam and I can apply good structure to my answers. Now in March of this year, the SQA updated guidance and business management falls into the first category that they have produced information, published information on broad topics or contexts that will or will not be in the exam this year. So business management, we've got a clear idea on what to revise so that we can focus on certain elements. Okay, just so that you know, if you see any of these symbols during this session, that will direct you to what you've got to do. I'll keep you right as well. Now, in the last session, we broke down the exam further into all of the dis different sections and the rough timings that you should spend. So we won't go over that, but I'm just going to remind you about the exam, that it's on the 18th of May. It is from nine o'clock until 11.45. So you've got two hours and 45 minutes to get everything done. It's worth 90 marks, which is 75% of your grade and it's split up into two sections. So we're going to start looking at understanding business and what comes up in an understanding business. So I'm going to read this through with you. First of all, we've got the sectors of industry and we are looking at the primary, secondary, tertiary and quaternary sectors. This question lends itself to Either a describe question, so describe the different sectors, or it might be a short, distinguish question. Then we've got the types of organisations, and we're going to focus a wee bit more on that today. To be able to describe the similarities and differences between structure and in terms of ownership, control and finance. And we're looking at public sector organisations and public limited companies. So again, that kind of question blends itself to either a compare or a distinguished question as well. Then we've got the objectives. Be aware of the aims and objectives of the different types of organisations listed to the left. So the objectives of a public sector and a public limited company, followed by all of these objectives. Then we've got growth. Now the only growth topic that looks like it's coming up says it's outsourcing because otherwise they would have asked us to um, look at something else. Then we've got the external factors, structures, including tall and flat and delaying. And then we've got decision making as well. So we're going to go run over some of these today and have a look at what's um, the style of questions that would be likely to come up. Okay, so the first thing that about types of organisation, it really lends itself to a compare question. So a common question that comes up would be to compare the features of a public limited company with a public sector organisation in terms of ownership, control and finance. So we're going to run through this. So the ownership of a public limited company is that it's owned by shareholders who can purchase shares on the stock market. Now this gets confusing because a lot of people get the, the few these two mixed up because it has the word public limited company. But just remember that anything that's a company or limited that it implies 
that the liability is limited. So therefore that should lead you on to thinking that a public limited company is owned. You or I can buy shares in a public limited company, whereas in a public sector organisation, it's owned by taxpayers. So if you think about and a classic example is the NHS, the NHS, we pay money if you're a taxpayer through our national insurance. So technically it's owned by taxpayers. Now the control can actually be quite similar. However, in a public limited company, it's controlled by a board of directors who makes the decisions. Whereas in a public sector organisation, it's controlled by elected politicians or government, or you could say um, elected civil servants or the um, trustees relating to the public sector. You've got to have the, the two difference. And the next one would be finance. A public limited company is financed through selling shares and private finance, such as bank loans. Whereas in a public sector organisation, it's financed through taxes such as income tax. It's always good to have a little example there to strengthen your answer. So it's likely that a compare question like that would come up. Or it might actually be a distinguished question because these two are actually very, very different. OK, so we're going to move on. And we're going to incorporate some questions into today's session. So a popular question when it comes to delaying is explain. So you can see here that these are the, the past paper questions from a num number of years. They often favour delaying as a question. So explain the advantages and disadvantages of delaying. Explain the benefits of delaying. Compare a tall and a flat organisational structure. Discuss an organisation's decision to flatten out their structure. And describe the effects of widening the span of control. Now, this, that question technically involves a flat organisation. So before we look at delaying, we really need to understand the features of a tall and flat structure. Now, if you want to, you could pause the video at this stage and complete some of the questions. OK, so before we look at delaying, what we need to do is look at tall structures versus flat structures. So we're going to explain them now. And the first thing that we can note about a tall structure is it's sometimes referred to as a hierarchical structure, and that's because it's got many levels of hierarchy or many levels of management. So it's got a lot of levels, therefore it's got a long line of commu communication and a long chain of command. That means it takes quite a while for information to flow from top to bottom, therefore it takes quite a long time for decisions to be made. Next thing we can note there is that there are few key decision makers and the few key decision makers are at the top of the organisation. And then they have a narrow span of control, which means that they are in charge of fewer people. And this is in comparison to a flat structure, which has fewer levels of management. Therefore, they have got a shorter chain of command or a shorter line of communication. And therefore, they've got a wider span of control. So this means that they are in charge of uh, a lot of people. Decision making this time is going to be delegated to all of these people here because the manager may not have time to make decisions. So therefore, they are delegated. OK, so, so to recap on the tall structure, it's got very many levels of management or hierarchy. It has a long chain of command and because of that, the decision making quite 
can be quite slow and unresponsive to change because it's got lots of levels to go through. Now, as I said in the previous slide, it has got few key decision makers at the top of the organisation and then it gets filtered down. The manager has a narrow span of control. So to go further with that, what that means is that because you're in charge of less people, you've got more time for planning and supporting your subordinates. A subordinate is somebody that is underneath you in the chain of command. However, because you're closely supervised, it might put pressure on staff because they often feel that somebody is breathing down their neck and, and watching them do their job. So it can it can be both good and bad. And because there's lots of levels of management, it means that there is possibly more promotion opportunities. And as we know, if there's a promotion opportunity, staff are motivated. Now, these answers would be suitable if you were asked to describe the features of a tall organisation. But often you would be asked to compare or distinguish between the two different structures. So let's have a look again. Remember back, we've got fewer levels of management and a shorter chain of command or a shorter line of communication, you could say. Um, so in this circumstance, communication may be faster because you've got fewer levels to go through. And because of this, you may respond quicker to the changes of the environment. Whereas in a flat structure, the decision making is therefore delegated to staff. In a tall structure, there is fewer decision making but because there's less management, then managers have to delegate. So they often delegate to staff and that can that can be good in two ways. It can be, it may motivate staff because they are empowered. And if they're motivated, then better quality work may come out of this. And that's how, how they might respond quicker to changes in the environment. However, Staff may resent doing extra work because it puts pressure on employees. So many, many employees may say, well, I'm asked to do all of this extra work, all of this decision making, but I'm not getting paid any extra for it. So they may resent doing it in the first place. And like a manager had a narrow span of control in a tall structure, in a flat structure, They've got a wider span of control. And so that means that obviously you're in charge of more people. So if you're in charge of more people, you yourself as a manager have got less time for planning. And it just means that snap decisions will be made um, if the time is limited. And in comparison to a tall structure, there are fewer levels of promotion or fewer opportunities for promotion. So that means that staff then may go elsewhere, may seek opportunities in other rival firms instead of getting promoted in their own firm. So you see on this, you could pause the video and have a look at um, writing this down or have a go at the question. So now that we know what a tall structure and a flat structure is, we can look at delayering. And if you understood the flat, tall structure and a flat structure, then delayering is actually easier to, to contemplate. So the first thing to think about is that delayering usually is a result of possibly after the recession or when a company decides that they have got to save money. So what they do is that they get rid of layers of management to flatten out the structure. So a tall structure becomes a flat structure. And with those layers of management removed, then you will reduce the expense of management salaries over time, which could be invested into the business, possibly into to growth. Now, because you're, again, you're a flat structure, 
that decision making will need to be delegated to make the organisation work. And people might be motivated by the fact that they've been given decision making powers. However, they may resent being asked to do the extra work as it puts more pressure on them. And often, again, it's due, this happens during an uncertain time, often when there has been um, a bid to reduce salaries. So there may be a little bit of more hostility or resentment to being asked to do, um, to do more. But with that, you should improve the lines of communication and decision making. It should be faster because there is a shorter chain of command because you're going through le fewer levels. Therefore, they may respond to changes in the environment. Managers, again, have a wide span of control, which means that they have less time for planning. So may make snap decisions. Also, just a reminder that these people that have got the decision making power now may be less qualified to make the decisions. So incorrect decisions may be made. There is less opportunities for promotions, which means that they may leave to seek opportunities elsewhere. And just a reminder again that it often comes after a recession. So staff may feel that their futures are uncertain, therefore further causing a bit more unrest and a bit more demotivation. And if people are demotivated in an organisation, then they may decide to leave. So all of these would be good points for delaying and explain. OK, next we go on to management of marketing. Now, this is shorter topics than we were expecting. So it just means that we've got less to revise in the marketing section. So we're looking for the different methods of field research and their costs and benefits, and the different methods of desk research and their costs and benefits. So when this comes up, it's likely to be a discuss question because you've got to understand the advantages and disadvantages. Under product, we have got the costs and benefits of having a product portfolio. Under price, the pricing strategies that they want you to look at would be skimming and the penetration pricing. And they also look at how technology can be used in marketing and the costs and benefits for it, focusing specifically on social media. So you might want to pause the slide at this stage if you want to take a note or make a checklist so that you know exactly what to revise. So we're going to go over product portfolio and looking at the previous questions, we have had a mixture of describe and explain. And a popular question is to put this into the case study. So you can see there that describe the benefits of Google to having a varied product portfolio as shown in exhibit 2.2, five marks. Describe the benefits of Toyota of maintaining a product portfolio as shown in exhibit two. And again, a similar question there for the Mackey's case study. And an explain question and possibly a discuss question. So we're going to have a look at this. And we're going to look at the Google case study. And this was exhibit two that you got. You got what's known as a Boston matrix. Now, Boston matrix isn't directly coming up this year. However, as they said in the at the start, you could use your knowledge of other things to be included in answers. So I'll, when we're going over this, I'll show you the, how that can be done. So you might want to pause the video at this stage if you want to attempt some of the questions. If not, just continue on listening. So we know that the product portfolio comes up. It may be a describe question. It may be an explain question and it could be a discuss. So we're going to try and cover all angles in this. 
And this is often quite a good revision technique is on your paper, you cover lots of different angles. So you try to hit the describe points, you hit the explain points and you hit the discuss points at the same time. So remember back to the first session, if you watched that, we talked about good technique in explain questions. And reminder that explain questions have two parts. You've got to have your description and then you've got to say why it's an advantage or why it's a disadvantage or why it's an impact. And in which case we underlined our described points and then the bits and then we added on to it. And if there was any bullet points, we those were development points. So this is the first point about a product portfolio. Is if you imagine a, a company like a well known sauce company that pr produces tomato sauce or produces tomato soup. If you sell more than one product, it means that a business can spread the risk over different markets. So if one product fails, they've got others to fall back on. And you could also say at this point that your losses may be minimised. But it also means that you've got steady demand as well. It means that you've always got profits coming in from lots of different places. And again, not everybody likes tomato soup. So they might have mushroom soup or they might have baby food. And it means that they can meet the needs of different market segments. And if you meet the needs of different market segments, it means that you're going to be more likely to satisfy your customers. So satisfaction may be higher. And if customers are satisfied, they're getting what they want, then it results in higher shares, higher, sorry, higher sales. And then if you can sell to more than one people, then an ultimate goal would be to increase your market share. And you could also say at that point that it increases the profits as a development point. Again, if you sell a range of products, you have got lots and lots of products with your name on it. So if you've got lots and lots of products with your name on it, then it increases the profile of the brand and that allows for growth in other countries. So if people become more aware, then it will help them become a bigger brand in another country because they've got lots of products available. Now, customers who are loyal to the brand may buy multiple products. And they, that will therefore increase sales because people buy more and more of them. So for example, I've got, um, I'm very fond of um, a biscuit, a well-known biscuit. And I love this biscuit, so therefore I will buy the biscuit spread that you can spread on toast or you can bake with it. But I also buy all of the other products because I love it so much. Therefore, it increases sales. And again, as the business is selling multiple products, higher profits may be achieved. Now, just watch out for repetition here. If you've already talked about higher profits, then you're unlikely to get the point again. It might be seen as a bit repetitive. So we've got easier to launch products with the existing portfolio. It reduces the risk of failure, which would be costly for the business. A business can plan when to introduce new products because they can see when old products are just starting to decline. So what they would do is they would map out all of their different products, probably on a product life cycle. And then when one product is going into decline, they'll have other ones ready to take over. And that's the idea of having having a wide product portfolio is that they will constantly be in business. Now, 
the previous slide I said that the Google um, the Google extract had a Boston matrix and although Boston matrix isn't necessarily examined this year you could use some of your answers and your answers would be fine to do that so the it can help identify the stars of your products now the, you don't need to go into too much depth about that but your stars are your products with your high market share and high market growth they're flying high and these this is an advantage to identify them because they're the ones that will help you become market leader and similarly your your cash cows if you identify your cash cows then they're the ones that basically um, get all your cash coming in and your cash that is coming in allow for riskier ventures to be funded so it allows you to take a risk if you've got money coming in from from these products now you could also mention at this stage the problem child and the sleeping dogs but i don't have enough space so on the same page as this, we can talk about disadvantages of product portfolio. Now, you will have increased research and development costs um, due to multiple products being produced. And obviously that is a big expense to the business. So you need to have that from retained profits in somehow. Some products will never get to the market, which means that investment is going to be lost and it has to be offset against profits. Promotion of a large end of products will be needed. Therefore, the marketing costs may be high due to this. So just a reminder that you can always talk about costs. And a further disadvantage that you could have would be that bad publicity incurred by one product may affect the sales of the product within a portfolio and therefore the reputation of the whole brand may be affected due to that so if you want to go back and do some of those questions and test yourself you can pause the video or rewind it back okay next we're going to look at social media and how technology can be used. So some of the questions that may come up would be to, now this one was the one in 2019, which was a similar question, not exactly the same, but it, it asked you to explain the advantages of an organization of using a smartphone application to promote the products. So if we were to change that to social media because the social media is going to be coming up then you could change it to that you might be asked to discuss social media as a method of promotion and also justify so you can pause the video at this stage to try and answer some of these questions okay so we're going to recap on social media and we'll put the describe questions and explain together so first things first about social media that it can gain a lot of information about the customers it's like an app actually that you have your social media on your phone and it can gather quite a lot of market research it can work out when people buy products when people are searching um, what was a particularly uh, a post liked was it did it was it received well was it received poorly they can they can do an awful lot of that which then helps them in the future for designing new marketing campaigns the target market can be contacted directly as they like or follow the business already so you've again you've got your customer at your fingertips also as well comments and reviews can be left which can be used to improve the product allowing for growth 
in other countries or in other areas. So if you were to go onto a business's social media account, people will comment or review and it's there in an instant. It can be used to advertise the product. Like and share competitions are very popular um, in which you've got to like a, an advert and then share it. And what that does is it snowballs and that can really help a business grow its customer base. Because if you've liked it, then they'll share the other promotions with you. Social media is often used in an app and apps can be accessed anywhere, allowing direct contact with customers. So initially when like Facebook was launched, it was mostly just on the computer. But now majority of users use it on their smartphone as with Instagram as well. So because it can be reached at their customers fingertips, it can operate 24 seven so that it can promote times. Promote at any time customers can reach the, pro the company at any time of the day, reaching more customers as well. Again, photographs, videos can be shown on social media, making it attractive and encouraging customers to buy the product. Information about the products can be updated really quickly, given a good channel of communication. Again, it's instant and it can be cheaper compared to television advertising. I wouldn't necessarily say it would be free because there might be some costs in it and there would obviously be costs in, in making the adverts, etc. But it can be cheaper to advertise compared to the likes of television advertising. But the disadvantages that it would take a lot of time to use social media effectively. So it takes it takes a lot of competitions. It takes a lot of posts. It takes a lot of effort to get that. And for some businesses, it can be a full time job. So many of the bigger bigger retailers out there will employ their own social media department and they've got to make sure that they get it right because mistakes happen and when mistakes happen it can again like it snowballed in competitions it can be counteractive and go the other way it can also be difficult to build up the following You've got, again, businesses have got to work hard at doing this. And especially if you're a small business, it can take time. And a final disadvantage that you could put would be that negative reviews can put off customers. But also the business doesn't have much time to react or come up, come up with a statement, um, especially if it's like a, a complaint. So complaints can be aired there straight away for everybody to see. Whereas in the olden days, before social media, if you had a complaint about a company, you had to write to them. You had to write or phone them. And whereas in this circumstance, if you've got a complaint, you just go straight to the, the, the company and they, again, are scrutinised by, by the media. So hopefully this should answer the, the questions that you might likely to get asked. And if you want to have a look at this and then go back and answer some of the questions to test your knowledge. Then I will look at management of operations. And in this, we will look at workforce planning. So we're talking about the elements of workforce planning and the costs and benefits of recruitment, of internal recruitment versus external recruitment and the costs and benefits of selection methods. In the training and development section, they will be looking at you to know about appraisal and it listed the ones that you they want to know, as well as the costs and benefits of appraisal to organisations and employees. The employee relations section looks at how organisations use employee participation 
as well as their costs and benefits to work councils, worker directors, consultative committees. And finally, under the legislation selection, they will be looking at the Equality Act. OK, so we're going to look at workforce planning and this time. We're going to look at a case study. So this has come up twice previously in the case study. And you're asked to describe three steps that Toyota may take in its workforce planning. So that's coming directly from the Toyota case study. And using the case study, describe the factors the Scottish government may have considered when developing its workforce planning strategy. So this one, because it says it may have used, it means that you can use your knowledge and apply it and try to apply it to the case study. Let's have a look at workforce planning. So just to turn it around, workforce planning is ex it's when you are planning for your current and future workforce. So if you think about the things that you consider when you're planning for your workforce, you need to plan things like staff leaving. You need to replace the staff. You need to train your staff. You need to motivate your staff. And that's essentially what workforce planning is. And the first thing that you would need to do, and the businesses might do this at certain times of year, the year, and definitely like likes of retail will will do this about just before Christmas time. Well, a lot before Christmas time to cope with Christmas rush. So they'll need to identify how many workers are going to be needed for that year. And they will take into consideration analytics like based on demand from the previous year, demand for the products, and they work out how many employees that they will need. They will also analyse the skills required, not just of new workers, but if there's any changes that are happening in the industries, then they might decide, OK, we need to upgrade the skills of our employees so they would have to work out what is needed and they would do this in the workforce planning stage. They would look at their current and future staff profiles to see what they, who they want, what they want in their staff. And then they will work out the gaps and then hopefully try to close them. Now, they'll close them in a number of ways. So they might decide to, if they've decided that one of the gaps is that there's a gap in the skills, then they will identify training needs and they will identify the budgets that are required to fulfill these training needs. And then therefore they will actually go about training the existing staff. So it's planning for training and then actually carrying out the training. And another gap that they might work out is that they have worked out that they need more staff. So if you work out that you need more staff, then you've got to the next stage would be to recruit and select new staff. And you would decide whether to do it internal or external. And another thing that's worth to consider is that you want to retain your staff. And that's called staff retention is when you um, keep your staff and you need to decide on how you're going to do that. Because you want to keep your staff, but you're going to have to decide if you're going to motivate them and you would work out if there's going to be a budget to motivate them. And that essentially would be the steps in workforce planning. So we're going to get you to take this question again. Would be just do this question number two. Using the case study, describe the factors the Scottish government may have considered when developing its workforce strategy. And in the last session, I said that the SQA should make it easy for you, that you don't have to go and hunt too far to find the information. So again, they've got like a wee section that says workforce planning strategy, 
So your information that you will find will be in here. So if you pause the video and complete the task. And just to go over the answers then. Uh, and what you'll find is that the answers are very similar to the ones that we've just done, but it's been applied to the NHS because you want to try to, to apply it to the case study. Right, so it'd be good if you start talking about employees or 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 doctors. So first of all, the answers that you could have had would be that they had to budget available to fund recruitment incentives. So they had to work out a budget. They had to work out how many employees or how many GPs are currently employed in order to identify the gaps. They analysed the future demand for the GP services and they looked at public health trends. They may look at GPs chosen retire age, retirement age, the number of medical graduates available, the ability to recruit overseas. So they mentioned in, at the bottom here that international recruitment was being used, the use of incentives to attract applicants to train staff and the skills of the current workforce training. So that looks like a tricky question. But if you have a look at and reinforce what workforce planning is, then you would be able to get pick up marks easily. OK, so the next topic is understanding operations in which the following are going to come up. So we've got inventory management, looking at the features, costs and benefits of a just in time inventory control. Methods of production include the costs and benefits of capital and mechanised and automated production system, including the costs and benefits of labour intensive and the reason for production choices. Quality looks at the importance of quality to an organisation, the distinction between quality control and quality assurance, as well as the following methods of quality. Ethics and environment, we look at costs and benefits of fair trade activities, including the Fair Trade Foundation and technology and operations focusing on computer aided design. OK, so the topic that we're going to go to over in operations is just in time manufacturing. And just like normal, here are some of the questions that you may get asked. So it comes up in a describe, a discuss and explain. And it also could be from the case study. So because we're looking at the features of a just-in-time manufacturing system, it's handy for us to revise this. If you want to do any of these questions, just pause the video. It's just a reminder that just-in-time manufacturing, so it's often referred to as just-in-time manufacturing, but actually it's a method of inventory control or stock control, whereby the business does not hold any inventory, but orders the goods, and then they arrive just in time to be put onto the production process. So it is ordered exactly when it's going to be needed. So that means that there's no stockpiling of any inventory. There's no need for any warehouses. But it does rely, rely on a good relationship with the suppliers because they have got to guarantee that they get stock. OK, so next we're going to look at the just in time described, explained and discussed. The first thing that we can say is that value of capital is not tied up in stock. This is because you are not purchasing stock. You're only using it when you need it. Therefore, the cash flow situation will improve because you are spending it just when you're receiving it. So the advantage of that is that you could use that money elsewhere in the business. 
less space will be required for the stock because you're not stockpiling it. So that means that you will reduce the cost of expensive warehouses. It is also a feature that you have a good relationship with your suppliers, but you could turn this into an advantage as well and say that it allows you to have a closer relationship with suppliers, which means that you may get discounts for being loyal. Because you're not stockpiling, you are reducing the chance of the stock going to waste. So it's reduced deterioration of stock. There's going to be less waste. And waste is a problem because you have to offset it against profits and that won't happen because you're not stockpiling. Stock will be more tightly controlled. This is because, again, there's no big warehouses to lose track of your stock. Therefore, it will be you have reduced theft. You don't need to have as much security because, say, if you're manufacturing a car and you're assembling the wheels, the wheels will come just in time to be assembled. So it relies quite heavily on a good logistics platform. Changes in fashion or trends will have a less of an impact because there's no stockpiling. You wouldn't, um, things won't go to waste. Production does not start until the order arrives. And again, that can save the electricity costs, etc. Um, no need to have the machinery constantly in operation. Disadvantages, however, there, whilst it does have a good relationship with suppliers, you're also very heavily reliant on your suppliers. And that means that they must be reliable to ensure the flow of production. Stock, therefore, may need to go straight to production without being checked. So quality checks will have to be put in place. And again, that's reinforcing that you must have a good relationship with the suppliers. You need to make sure that they are supplying you with consistent materials, consistent quality of materials. Big problem if stock does not arrive. If there's holdups, then your production can be stopped. And that means the orders to customers will be delayed. Further consequence of that, if that repeatedly happens, then it could lead to customers going elsewhere um, and potentially getting a bad reputation. Now, because you're not buying in bulk, you are going to be buying quite frequently and in less quantities, so you may lose out in bulk buying discounts, which of course will re reduce, um, would, would potentially reduce the cost of production. So profits may be used because you're losing out on that. The cost of production would therefore be higher. Because you're ordering goods more frequently, you'll be more frequently transporting your goods so the cost of transport may be higher and you could also as a development point pick up the fact that the environmental carbon footprint is an issue there because you'd be frequently traveling rather than buying it in bulk and because you're placing more orders you'll obviously have more admin costs so in this section, we've looked at your described points or ex your explained points, and we've looked at advantages and disadvantages should discuss come up. And lastly, the management of finance section has also been cut back a lot, in which you're asked to devise the sources of finance. And you've got a long list of ones there that you could use. Cash budgets, the purpose of producing a cash budget, interpretation and analysis of the cash budget, and solutions to cash flow problems. Financial statements, the purpose, main elements, and interpretation of an income statement. So we're going to focus on cash budgets in this session. So the common questions that come up uh, in the previous years 
would be to describe the advantages of using a cash budget, explain the benefits of preparing a cash budget. They also ask you to describe the impact of having poor cash flow and describe the actions a business could take to overcome flat cash flow problems. Now we're going to focus on questions two and four today, but if you want to pause the video, you can attempt the questions. So before we look at what a cash budget, the benefits to a cash budget, we need to actually see what cash budget is. So just to start with, a cash budget is a forecast of the expected inflows and outflows of a business for a period of time for the future. So in this circumstance, we've got a cash budget for a company from January to March. And it records all the money coming in, or the receipts in this case, all the money coming out, which are the, would be categorised as the payments. And it also shows you what you have got at the end of the month, or the end of the, 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 the period in which you're preparing the cash budget for. And that helps us mostly with decision making, right? So the first thing that we could say that is that highlights a business when the business will have a surplus. Now a surplus is when you have got more money coming in than going out. We do not talk about profit at this stage because it's purely just the flow of cash. So we refer to it as a surplus. And you can see there the, the January closing balance of January is 2,500. Now it's good that we identify periods where we have surpluses because that helps us plan expenditure. For example, it will help us plan when we are going to purchase or when it's the most appropriate place to purchase a van, for example. Similarly, it can help identify a deficit. Now a deficit is the opposite to a surplus, which means that more money is going out than coming in. Again, we don't talk about a loss at this stage because it's just the flow of cash. That's why we refer to it as a deficit. Now, a deficit, if you highlight that, it helps us control spending. It will help us where we need to cut back on or take corrective action, such as getting an overdraft. So if we know that we're going to have, um, in the month of March, we're going to have a deficit, then it can help us in advance to work out right where are we getting our finance from are we going to get a loan or are we going to try to increase sales or are we going to cut back on the amount of overtime that we give our staff so it helps them prepare for that now because this has been done for the future when the actual period comes around we can compare comparisons between in predictions and actual figures and that helps monitor performance to see whether or not we are achieving. It's almost like setting a target as well. It helps us identify periods where spending is high so that can allow us to take corrective action. So here we have a look. Our wages have increased in February so we might think, OK, that's too high, so we might have to cut back on over overtime or have is our purchases too high? In which we might decide to find a cheaper supplier. It's a decision making aid. So it will help us improve our cash flow or work out our cash flow because it provides cash flow information. So therefore, it will help us make decisions. And again, because this is a budget, it's for the future, you could it considered to be as a target, a target for businesses to work towards. And whenever there's a target involved, then it should motivate employees because they've got a goal to work towards. So this would be a suitable answer for a describe. So your underlying points are your describe points and the the, the bits after the dash would be your explain points combined. OK, one of the other questions on cash budgets was to 
and identify problems from the cash cash flow statement and then provide solutions to cash flow problems. And sometimes it's good to just visualize this. So in the circles, we can see what's going on. So you can see here that just from this alone, that the sales have decreased, purchases have increased, wages have increased, and you've actually another problem could be that you have purchased a van in March and overall the closing balance is in deficit. So the problems that we could have, and these are typical problems of cash flow problems, is that you've got low sales or demand is falling. And so you need to decide, right, that is giving us a problem. So what are we going to do? You could adjust the marketing mix. Now, you could be specific about your answers here. You could do some more promotions or you could increase your selling prices or change in a new location. So you could add on to that um, if you wanted to. Now, you might have too much money tied in stock. So say your purchases are really quite high. And you don't necessarily want your purchases to be too high because if it's just sitting there, it's not getting sold. And if it's not getting sold, it's not becoming profitable. So you might have too much money tied up in stock. And what you would want to do is reduce it. But you could reduce it in a number of ways. So you could sell your product at a markdown price, so reduce the, the price in which that you would get less profit margin per item, but you're getting rid of your stock. And you could also operate a just-in-time manufacturing system to reduce the amount bought at once. So you're only buying the stock when you've got a customer order. As we can see there that the, the business expenses were increasing. So in this case, it was the wages were increasing and the purchases were increasing. You could also find a cheaper supplier or if it was specific to wages, you could possibly cut down on overtime. You purchased um, expensive equipment. So in this circumstance, in March, you bought a van for £5,000 and that didn't help you with your deficit. So if you purchase expensive equipment instead of doing it, let's say that you need the equipment, you could lease it or get the equipment on higher purchase. And what that would allow you to do is you would have, instead of one big lump sum going out, you would be able to spread the cost of the payment over a number of years. So it makes for better budgeting. Another problem that you could be having would be that your customers are not paying you. You have maybe given them too much customer credit, which means that it could be either you've given them too many customers credit or um, given them too long a uh, time to pay. Either way, they're not the money's not coming in, so you need to get it in and you could do something like giving customers discounts to encourage them to pay that little bit quicker so that you get your inflow of cash. Um, another problem that you could have would be that you've got too many unpaid debts. That's very similar to the last question, but you could um, argue in another, another way. If you've got too many unpaid debts to you, you could sell your debts to a debt factoring company to allow an injection of cash. Just to remind you what a debt factoring company is, is that say you have got, let's say, say you've got £100 worth owed to you from, from customers, from your debt. And you needed that money right here, right now. But chasing up the debts actually takes quite a long time. What you could do is you could sell a debt, you could sell your debt to a debt factoring company and let's say they, they give you £90. You would get the £90 straight away. So that means that you would get the money coming in, 
like straight away. And the debt factoring company would then be the ones that would be responsible for chasing up the debt. And they would get £100 back. So that's how debt factoring companies make their money. You may have an expensive loan repayment. And you could also decide, well, you can't just stop paying it, but you could look at a, a cheaper loan for that, perhaps, or maybe renegotiate with your bank your terms so that you can pay like a lower amount every month. So that would reduce your outcome goings further. So that's us come to the end of this revision session. Just to give you a quick review of what we've done and a reminder that the exam is on the 18th of May, 9 o'clock till 11.45. Just a reminder that the SQA has issued a revision guide at the start of March, which is also included in this presentation. And we have come covered some trickier topics and popular topics coming up in the exam. Okay, so that's us to the end of our session. And the next steps for you guys will be to revise topics from areas that we've not covered. So what you can do is you can gather your past paper questions on the topics that we have not gone over today, applying the same technique that we've looked at. So all the best for the exam, hope it goes well, hope these revision sessions have been useful. Bye for now.